Hi, I'm Matthew Burchette, and this is another episode of Curator on the Loose. Gee, I wonder what we're gonna talk about today. So just like the Jesus nut holds the helicopter together, Lori York holds this part of Life Flight Network together. I know it's, I know Ooh. you're looking at me like, oh, really? That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Tell us what you do here. So um, I'm a flight nurse and also a customer service manager for our Coopville base here based on Woodby Island. And um, one of the great things I get to do in addition to taking care of patients is I get to meet awesome people like you and talk about um, Life Flight and what we do. Well, thank you so much. We, I cannot even begin to express how excited we are to be here. Can you give us kind of that 30,000 foot overview of what Life Flight Network is? Yeah, so Life Flight started uh, about 43 years ago, 1978, wow. um, and then it's grown since then. We're operating out of four states, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and Montana. And we have about 30 bases now. And of those 30, we have uh, our helicopters and also our fixed wings. Um, we got about 12 of them out of those. And then also we do ground transport as well. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So um, we're taking uh, patients, uh, you know, that are in these remote areas or time sensitive emergencies, heart attacks, stroke, multi-systems traumas, and getting them the speed that they need to get to a cardiologist, trauma team, neurologist. Um, and uh, we are the largest not-for-profit uh, air medical service uh, in the nation. No and um, it, it's a very unique job and a very rewarding job that uh, I feel very privileged and honored that I get to do. As much as I would like to say that I fly this helicopter, we all know that is not even close to being the truth. So, we have a life flight helicopter pilot. This is Kyle Mann. Kyle, thank you so much for staying up an extra 15 minutes for us. You're welcome. Better, better hit the old timer now. So you are actually in the pilot seat, which is a little bit different than being in the pilot seat of a fixed wing aircraft, which is where I would be. Why is that? Um, so in a helicopter, the Cyclic is a and pretty... And that's that stick. That is this stick. Okay. <laughs> um, the joystick, or I mean, layman's terms. Um, it's a more crucial control. It's what makes you go forward, aft, left, and right. Um, in some helicopters, there's no force trim. There's no autopilot. So if you let go, uh, the helicopter will flip over. Oh, that's not good. Uh, so you want to avoid the flipping over part. <laughs> and uh, so keeping your hand on that control is pretty important. So if you need to adjust any controls, radios, or make any changes to any configuration, it's real easy to do it. You just keep your right hand on the, on the cyclic and you can adjust whatever you need to. So tell us a little bit about this bird. This is a Bell 429. Yes. And what's, what can it do? It can do a lot. So it has four axis autopilot, with that, it will maintain um, your airspeed. It will, if you want to increase your speed, it will automatically adjust your power for you. Oh wow! Um, so climb, descend, do holds for you. Uh, pretty much anything you want to do, as long as you know how to program it and push all the right buttons, <laughs> it'll get it done. That's why you go to flight school. <laughs> Which button do I push? Which button do you push? <laughs> and speaking of buttons, there are not a lot of them in here because it's all kind of a glass cockpit. Yes, and uh, not any. Normally, there's like a huge panel of yeah, circuit no breakers, and it's a very clean configuration. And you will also fly with night vision devices. Yes. Have you been? Have you done that yet? Yes. Is that kind of weird? It is. Uh, it seems surreal when you first start doing it. Uh, it is very strange. It's kind of a different depth perception, and you you have to kind of get the feel for. For it because it, it does a lot of your visual cues you know flying so much of it is the way the you know your approach angle and rate of closure is the feeling of the ground and everything um, and it changes a little bit yeah with the night vision goggles. and you don't have a very wide field of vision on things those things do you uh no about 40 degrees Oof. so it's a much smaller so you really got to have your head on a swivel when you're doing that 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll stick to the daytime. <laughs> All right, you have been a real trooper. Uh, in considering now that you know you got your cool pilot sunglasses <laughs> on, I'm going to put my cool passenger sunglasses on. So thank you so much. Of course, thank um, you. Go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> okay. Appreciate it. All right, let's check out what makes this thing tick. They say that a helicopter is over a million parts, all desperately trying to get away from one another all at once. And there's one thing keeping that from happening. And it's, bam, this guy, Shane Satirio. Shane, you are the mechanic for Life Flight up here at Coopville. What I'd really like to do is kind of get a look at the engine on this beast. Can we do that? Yeah, let's oh, see what we can do. This is gonna be so cool. I love this kind of stuff. So awesome. Get up here. This is kind of like our all-in-one transmission and front of engine compartment access. We're just gonna come right up here. Oh, nice. It's so clean. We try to keep them clean. <laughs> clean bird works better. This is our main transmission. This is what drives the entire rotor system. Okay. Uh, we have twin engines. Uh, they put out about 625 shaft horsepower. Uh, for takeoff, they're rated up to about 730. Each engine can separately run the rotor system, and that's what they're there for as a redundancy in case one. Oh, for any such awesome. reason fails in flight, yeah. you can still get safely to where you need to go to make an emergency landing. No kidding. Um, yeah, here's the front of the engines over here if you want a better look. <clears throat> so on the front of the engines, this is our accessory gearbox. That's where all of like the fuel governor and fuel control unit and the starter and the accessory drives are located. Okay. Uh, we have an emergency fire extinguisher system and sensors in the bottom of the compartment. Wow. So, on every helicopter, there is what they call a Jesus nut. Yes. What is it, <laughs> and does this helicopter have one? So, the Jesus nut is, well, what's referred to as a Jesus <laughs> yeah. nut is a mast nut, and that keeps the rotor system attached to the mast of the helicopter that comes up out of the transmission. That's what turns, the mast is what turns everything. The rotor system sits on the mast on a spline shaft, and then the mast nut secures that. Secures that. And it has individual locks on it, as well as being extremely torqued onto the mast. Do you know right off the top of your head what that torque is? Uh, I want to say somewhere in the 750 Holy foot range. Holy moly. Um, it's, it's a hefty torque. How do you get torque on that? Uh, so we actually use a torque multiplier, which is a, a box that has a reduction gear system on it and you put in a small input and the reduction gear system increases that tenfold. No, so I that's might put cool. in 100 foot pounds of torque and it's multiplying it up to 1000 foot pounds of torque. Wow. And you put it on and lock it in and you keep it at that torque and let it sit on there for a period of time. We usually do at least 48 hours of having that torque multiplier sit on so that it because it slowly keeps tightening it until it stops. No kidding. Yeah. I could use that for my Subaru. Oh yeah, you'd never get your wheels off again. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go take a look at the tail rotor? Because that thing is kind of fascinating to me. There is just all sorts of detail poking out of that thing. Sure thing. Yeah, all right, can awesome. take a look right now. Yeah. All I'll right. I'll try not to smack my head on this thing. Yeah, be careful around the uh, horizontal there. Yeah, I'm about almost at the right <laughs> height. These are at least a, a little higher on the 429 than most <laughs> other aircraft. I've, I've definitely walked into my picture. So four blades, more efficient? Uh, more efficient, it, it definitely helps with the anti-torque, yeah. which is what a tail rotor really is called. It's an anti-torque rotor, keeps the helicopter from turning the opposite direction. So anti-torque just basically makes the helicopter not go around in a circle, but it allows the pilot left, right. Correct, so up here we have these pitch links these are what allow the pilot to change the pitch of the tail rotor. Okay. So when he gives input, his input from the pedals transmits all the way back here through a series of cables and push-pull tubes. And then he, through this center shaft here, it pushes this in and out, which transmits to these pitch links, uh, okay. which turn these pitch horns and actually pivot these on these elastomeric bearings that are installed in here. 
you can see these rubber bearings that allow the oh, yeah. tail rotor to flap. These also twist on that axis. That is really cool looking. All right, so what's your favorite part of this helicopter? I mean, I, I gotta love the, the swash plate system on every helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the swash plate is what allows a helicopter to exist. Yeah. So the swash plate is what allows the rotor system to turn independent of the transmission, but still be connected and still be able to control the pitch of those items, of the blades. And that's really what makes a helicopter a helicopter. I mean, truly. Yeah. yeah. Because you have the spinning mass, but how do you make the rotor blades then change pitch so that you yeah. can lift off the ground or settle back down? You gotta have two rotating discs on top of each other that allow you to transmit that push-pull authority into the rotor system. And without a swash blade, it, it really wouldn't be possible. That is amazing. All right, we're gonna take a look at some of the instrumentation in the Bell 429, and this is another pilot, Kaysen Hurd. Kaysen, I got a question. Shoot. Can we turn this thing on and see some of this instrumentation? Because like I said earlier, it's all a glass cockpit. Well, I'm not quite sure how to turn it on. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you had me going for just a minute. I was like, wait, what? So oh. this is the- Hey, that boots up quick. This is the latest generation of, of aircraft where you notice everything is flat screen now, just like your kids on their, their iPads instead of the steam gauges. These are kind of a holdover from that era, and there are standby gauges, and that's their sole purpose is standby. Everything now is flat screen, uh, touch screen actually, you can manipulate uh, on touch screen. It's very reliable, just an incredible amount of information that we get nowadays compared to when I flew. I started flight school in 1990, and what I have on this computer is just, uh, it's witchcraft. <laughs> which, which, which witchcraft. So we're looking at compass, artificial horizon. And so I look at this for attitude, airspeed, everything was flying and, uh, and navigating the aircraft. So that's almost like what they call the six pack. Uh, the six pack it would be more over here. Okay. Six pack meaning uh, all the engine instruments, your, your pressure gauges, all, all the parameters that you know that the aircraft is operating safely, that's all on here now. And I can touch buttons and the information comes up. This is how I communicate and navigate. Uh, we have the latest in GPS and we have redundancy. That's another key to these aircraft, all aircraft, is that they have redundancy built in. So all the things that used to be in volumes of, of books, I can access. So if I have a problem with my, this is, this is witchcraft. So if I have a problem with the aircraft, I just go to systems and I can actually pull up the different pages and get the schematics. And the schematics will tell me what my systems are doing. Green wow. being good, yellow being not so good, and red being bad. If I was in flight and I had a problem, something would turn red. And it really helps the pilot troubleshoot because I know something's wrong, but I can pull up this page and now I know exactly what's wrong, and I can do the exact, right, correct, safe procedure. That, it's amazing. I, I agree with you. This is all witchcraft. <laughs> and but it's good witchcraft. It's, it's, it's white witchcraft. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where it all happens, right back here in the actual cabin. And so we have Will Koenig. Will, you are a... Flight nurse. Flight nurse. And Chris Petrick, you are a... Flight paramedic. So what's the difference between the two? Well, we both in the aircraft pretty much do the same thing. The medics typically have more pre-hospital experience, EMS. Okay. Um, the nurses typically have more ICU type experience. Uh. Um, so when we have a, say a car accident, um, the paramedics typically know the EMS system very, very well. Um, they know how to manage a the scene. They know how to stabilize a patient on the scene before they've been x-rayed and all that kind of stuff. Um, the nurses uh, typically have more experience with like adjusting ventilators and um, different drips, like ICU level care. Um, so it's kind of like the best of both worlds, having both of you guys in here. So it's it's great for the patient, which is what LifeLight is all about, offering that quality care. I think that's a distinction our company likes to make is that it is kind of unique to this area to fly nurse and paramedic together. Most companies fly nurse, nurse. 
there are strengths to that too and we can do that here mm -hmm. but we i think life flight does like the two perspectives sort of coming together in that way so there's not as much quote unquote gear in here <laughs> that i would expect and obviously it's so that you can do the work you need to do and have the patient in here but like what do you have in here and what can and cannot happen while you're in flight this is essentially an aerial uh, intensive care unit. So wow. what we have over here is a ventilator, um, identical to ones you would see in a hospital. Cardiac monitoring. Um, we have the ability to place advanced airways. We have three IV or six IV pumps that we could run medicated infusions on. We carry blood and plasma here, so we're able to transfuse that as well. Um, so we, we like to think we're just as capable as an emergency department or an ICU. Um, and have the equipment to be able to do that. Yep. And sometimes there's like, um, some hospitals just don't have, like they may only have two units of blood in their entire hospital. Wow. So, you know, when we show up, we've just doubled the blood supply or more. So, um, so yeah, some small hospitals just don't have a lot of um, resources. So we bring, or they don't have the, the skills. So, you know, you may have a, an ER that's staffed by a family practice doctor who just mm. doesn't have experience intubating even though he legally can do it, he just doesn't have the experience that we do. So um, sometimes it's the skills that we're bringing in. Sometimes it's just, you know, the getting there quickly and being able to do those interventions during flight if something happens. So we were talking earlier and I asked, you know, did you do this because it was exciting? And the response was that if we're, if it's exciting, we're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is a perfect response. You know, you don't want an exciting mission. You want it to go very smoothly, get the patient out and back to a hospital or wherever it needs to happen. That's awesome. And I think that's what Life Light is all about. Will, yeah. thank you so thank much. You. Yep. Chris, thanks. You bet. We appreciate it. Okay, Laura, thank you so much for this entire day. This has been awesome. But what we didn't see is how do you guys actually get the patient in there? And since we're right here at the hospital, can we maybe wheel me in or something? Well, you know, today might not be the best day, but in about a week, we're gonna be doing some training and we'd love for you to be our Ooh. patient. Oh, and we're yeah. gonna be working with the fire department and oh. we'd love for you to come during that time and do that. Yes, please. Yes. Okay, we are about to do a hot load, which means that the blades on the helicopter are gonna be turning. They're gonna load me into this life flight helicopter while the engine is running. And I'm gonna come right under the blades on a stretcher. This is the only way I wanna do this ever. But stay tuned, cause they are gearing up to go. Those are my feet. <laughs> <laughs>